Up next on 60 Minuets. Toxic chemical exposure can have multiple effects on children's health. Lower IQ scores, ADHD, even autism, asthma, and possibly cancer. In Toxic Bodies, N. Badley investigates how toxic chemicals are undermining our health. We're depressing the intellectual resources of, of the entire society. Why neurotoxins may be behind the dumbing down of America. A special report from Dan Rather Not. For decades, corporate America has assured the public its products are safe. But are they? Have they been proved to be safe, Mr. Coleman? I believe they have not been proved to be unsafe. Mike Wallace follows the money behind these claims in Money Talks. We found documents in which they literally signed secrecy agreements, promising not to tell the government and anyone about the results of their findings. The longer that there is delay, the more profit that uh, companies can make from selling toxic chemicals. Leslie Stald examines why it's so difficult to ensure chemicals are safe in the politics of science. In theory, the government should be making sure that chemicals are safe before they go into our products. But the way that the laws are set up is that they can't keep up. Morley Safety uncovers what you need to know in Buyer Beware. I'm Mike Wallets. I'm Morley Safety. I'm Dan Rather Not. I'm Leslie Stald. And I'm End Badly. Those stories and some really smart scientists tonight on 60 Minuets. For years, environmental health scientists have been likened to Chicken Little shouting from the rooftops that the sky is falling. Now the evidence is piling up, and it's showing that when it comes to our health, Chicken Little might be right. Rates of a whole series of diseases in children are rising. Rates of asthma have increased threefold in the last 30 years. The two principal types of childhood cancer, which are leukemia and brain cancer, have both increased by about 40%. Rates of autism, attention deficit disorder, and other learning disabilities are up. Certain birth defects have more than doubled. So the question comes up, what's causing this? Dr. Philip Landrigan saw the effects of toxic chemicals on children when he was a pediatric resident in the 1960s and is one of the world's leading experts on environmental health. A number of chemical companies over the years have knowingly sold hazardous products. We knew that lead paint could cause poisoning in children as early as 1910, more than 100 years ago. And yet the lead industry continued to sell lead paint in this country until they were legally banned from doing so in 1976. And they're still selling lead paint overseas where they can get away with it. Toxic chemical exposure can have multiple effects on children's health. That means lower IQ scores, more behavioral problems like ADHD, even autism, obesity in childhood, also asthma, and possibly cancer. Professor Pereira should know. She is the founder of the Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health, where her team has been studying the effects of toxic chemicals and environmental pollutants on children. We have documented so many different exposures to flame retardants, to phthalates, bisphenol A, air pollutants, organophosphate pesticides, chemicals that shouldn't be in the bodies of newborn children and yet they are. So we have a lot of tips for people about how they can avoid toxic chemical exposures, but sometimes you can't actually do anything about it. Professor Tracy Woodruff is a former EPA scientist who now leads the University of California San Francisco's program on reproductive health and the environment. I had had a kid in the 1970s. The only way that I could prevent lead exposure in the air to my child is for the government to get lead out of gasoline. Starting in 1976, we took lead out of gasoline. Blood lead levels in American children dropped by 95%. Uh, the incidence of childhood lead poisoning dropped by more than 90%. The effects of toxic chemicals, scientists say, begin before children are born. Children are exquisitely sensitive to many of these toxic exposures, and that's because the brain and other systems are developing very, very quickly. And during this period, it, you can almost think about a choreography, a dance that is very tightly programmed. And any chemical or, or other 
toxic exposure that gets in there can disrupt this dance, and the consequences can be very long-lasting. Up next, Mike Wallace follows the money behind corporate safety claims in Money Talks. For decades, corporate America has assured the public its products are safe. But are they? We decided to take a look at what's behind these claims. Money. Have they been proved to be safe, Mr. Coleman? I believe they have not been proved to be unsafe because when, as and if, any ingredient in cigarette smoke is identified as being injurious to human health, we are confident that we can eliminate that ingredient. The babies born from women who smoke are smaller, but they're just as healthy as the babies born from women who do not smoke. I do not believe that glyphosate in Argentina is causing increases in cancer. You can drink a whole quart of it and it won't hurt you. It's, yeah, uh, it, you want to drink some? We have some here. I'd be happy to, actually. But you, not, not really, but... Not really? I know it wouldn't hurt me. So it's dangerous, I right? Know, I, no, people try to commit suicide no, with no, it and but, fail no, fairly regularly. Tell the truth. It's, it's not dangerous, dangerous to humans, no. <laughs> well, I'm not going to drink any. Uh, here representing Field Turf, uh, the global leader in, uh, in, in turf installations. Um, my question for the Field Turf uh, is there lead in your products? There's lead in a lot of things in this world. Uh, paint. <laughs> We're just talking. Uh, <laughs> We're just... And, and so I will make sure that everybody knows that it is. Yes, um, there is. I, I don't appreciate that, that result. I was just asking is there lead in your oh, product? <laughs> I, um, sir, yes, there is lead in our product. Okay. We had no idea, I had no idea at all, that we had any kind of a process here in our plant operations that could do such a thing to a human being. There was a study funded by Dow. What it showed was that with very high doses of DBCP, you could get testicular atrophy, if you will, the shriveling up of the testicles. I've talked to uh, two scientists who are familiar with that work, and they both say, heck, we just, we just didn't draw the conclusion that there'd be sterility from the fact that the testicles were shriveling up. You think? Right after 60 Minuets, your local news investigates flame retardants in your furniture. For years, scientists have said our system to regulate toxic chemicals is not working. We wanted to know why. The longer that there is delay, the more profit that uh, companies can make from selling uh, toxic chemicals. We have a very strong ideology in our country that is against regulation. David Rosner and Gerald Markowitz are researchers who have written more than eight books, including Deceit and Denial and Lead Wars, The Politics of Science and the Fate of America's Children. It took Congress more than 30 years to change the Toxic Substances Control Act. Why did it take so long? Industry engages in a great effort to create doubt about the science, and by creating doubt, people are uncertain, and so they're reluctant to demand action uh, from Congress. And we have this weird system in the United States that we presume a chemical to be safe unless it is absolutely proven to be dangerous. I mean, we all remember the history of tobacco. We understand that's fairly well known where industry just said prove to us this causes cancer. It's very difficult when you're dealing with products that take 20, 30, 40 years to show their effects. One of the most eye-opening moments for me in your book, Lead Wars, was when you talked about how manufacturers blame parents and children for getting lead poisoning. They actually tried to deny the danger by putting out ads that said lead is good for your health. They literally say this and they start doing things like producing little puppets, Leslie, uh, just like you, that go about uh, advertising to children uh, how good lead is. They'd even blame puppets if they could. As you studied the history of lead poisoning, what did you find the most alarming? In 1904, you had the first article that talked about uh, children dying of uh, lead poisoning. That the World War I, you had a variety of European countries banning lead in interior paints. The United States uh, did not uh, adopt those kinds of regulations. 
And in fact, in the 1920s, we actually added lead to gasoline. Instead of taking it out of something, we added it to gasoline. The U.S. finally started to get lead out of paint and gasoline in the late 1970s. The benefits, scientists say, were almost immediate. What we saw was a tremendous uh, decline in the average blood lead levels of children. Although in the case of lead in paint, it remains in people's homes and children continue to be lead poisoned. Even at low levels, what was exposed is that children continue to be damaged. Not of damage that is completely obvious. They're not dying, they're not convulsing, they're not going into comas like they used to go into. But now we're finding that they have all sorts of problems that basically set them back in life. Put simply, these scientists say, we need to stop putting our heads in the sand. The new bill is an example of the kind of compromise that is constantly being made. I don't want to necessarily it, demean it. I will. Okay. Uh, it will take a hundred years for us to be able to uh, test all the chemicals that need to be tested to assure the safety of the products that we're using every day under this new bill. Up next, why neurotoxins may be behind the dumbing down of America. A special report from Dan Rather Not. Dr. David Bellinger is worried about what he calls the dumbing down of America. He studies the effect of chemicals on children's health and says that Americans have lost millions of IQ points due to exposure to neurotoxins. Children's brains are being affected by their chemical exposures and increasingly at lower levels than we had previously thought. You might be thinking, what are neurotoxins and do I come in contact with them? Neurotoxins are chemicals that influence the brain either in terms of its structure or its function. The chemicals that we know the most about in terms of their impact on the brain would be lead, methylmercury, arsenic, polychlorinated biphenyls, and the list continues to increase. How does this work exactly? It can affect the way different cells in the brain communicate with one another. The brain ends up being wired not quite as it should be. How are you able to pinpoint that the loss of IQ points is due to these chemicals? It is a challenging methodological uh, issue. We look at uh, the, the findings of multiple studies and if they're all pointing in the same direction then we start to have more confidence in, in the conclusion that the chemical is doing something bad to the brains of the children. If we know these chemicals are such a problem, then why do we still use them? These are not strictly scientific questions. Um, many of these chemicals have important economic forces that are advocating for their continued use. And these discussions are very contentious. Every time the Centers for Disease Control wanted to reduce the action level used to identify children with too much lead, they were sued. What? Lead and gasoline or the flame retardants. These episodes uh, reflect the same approach that has been used uh, for decades. We allow a product to be introduced into the marketplace and basically do an, a natural experiment on the population and on children. Oh. It's totally backwards. I mean, we should be screening products before they go into the marketplace for toxicity and so uh, that we don't put ourselves in this position of decades later finding out that was a very bad decision. It really affects people's lives, especially children. There are more than 85,000 industrial chemicals registered for use today, but environmental health scientists say that most have never been tested. We wanted to know why. When it comes to chemicals, our system favors corporate profits over the public's health. Professor Tracy Woodruff is a former EPA scientist who now heads the University of California, San Francisco's program on reproductive health and the environment. She and her team study the effects of toxic chemicals on people. Who is responsible for making sure that chemicals are safe? It turns out that the public is ending up making sure that chemicals are safe. In theory, the government should be making sure that chemicals are safe before they go into our products. But the way that the laws are set up is that they can't keep up, nor do they have the power to make sure they're safe. How many chemicals have been banned by the EPA? The EPA has banned five chemicals since 1976. That would lead many people to believe that most chemicals are safe. 
Yeah, but in Europe, they have either banned or restricted over a thousand chemicals since 2009. After more than 30 years of inaction, Congress updated the Toxic Substances Control Act, the legislation governing chemical oversight. Under the new rules, the EPA will have more power to order companies to test their products. However, some scientists say that the new rules still favor manufacturers over public health. Once a chemical is in use, it's very difficult to pull it off the market. Once it gets out there, it contaminates the air and water and food. A big problem, Woodruff and others say, is that people and puppets assume that what they buy is safe. How can consumers protect themselves? It's not easy, but we do have a couple recommendations. First, consumers can look to watchdog groups like Breast Cancer Fund or Environmental Working Group that monitor chemical research. There's even an app called Safety Nest that people can use to look up the types of things in their home and give them tips about how to reduce chemical exposures in your home. Second, you should check labels. Our recommendation is simpler is better. Try and choose things with less ingredients. Third, ask for the safety data on products that don't have labels. So these kinds of items can have things like formaldehyde. Just asking for this information sends a message that you want to know that the chemicals they're using in their products are safe. Well, that's a lot of work. That's why we want government rules to be stronger to protect families. How can we do that? We need to change the burden of proof so that it's on the manufacturers to prove the chemicals are safe before they get into the products. Second, we need to arm consumers with information, whether that's labeling or other mechanisms. And third, we need to make it easier to act on the scientific data we have on hand in order to take action to reduce harmful chemicals and get them out of our products. What are we waiting for?